You know, this global movement known as Me Too would not have happened without the leadership of my first guest tonight. For more than 25 years, activist and advocate Tarana Burke has worked at the intersection of sexual violence and racial justice. So here are some questions we're gonna talk about. What has this movement achieved? Where are we now? And how did it all really begin? It is such an honor to welcome to the stage Tarana Burke. We'll do the air kiss. <laughs> <laughs> Tarana, look at Tarana. Does she look fabulous? Sparkly. Well, I mean, I had to dress up for this occasion. Uh, well, you look awesome, and thank you so much for spending some time with us tonight. You know, you wrote your own, own memoir that came out in September yes. called Unbound, yes. which is a beautiful cover, by the thank way, Tarana. So thank and you And I know the book, you, the book you wrote ended up being a very different book than you set out to write. Yeah. So what did you want to write, and what did it become? Well, I always thought that, well, first of all, hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I thought I was going to write a book for survivors about what survival looked like. I mean, I've seen so many misconceptions about that in and of itself that I wanted to write about survival stories. Um, and you know, part of it was personal and part of it was the people around like, no, 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 you have to write a memoir. <laughs> um, it quickly became a memoir because the distortion that I saw was partly because people didn't really know, understand the origins of Me Too. So hearing people say things like, oh, it's a witch hunt. Oh, it's just trying to take down powerful men. Oh, it was like. You said people would take selfies and say one, two, three. Me Too. I'm like, no, that's actually not OK. Right. <laughs> it's not. It's like a thing that you say when you've been through a thing. Um, so I just knew people really didn't understand it. And I could not explain it in like, six minute sound bites on an evening news, right? I needed time to unpack the story and get into the, the nooks and crannies of it. And unpack the story of your life, which yeah. is why it's such a, an important and powerful memoir because of your personal experiences, both as a, a little girl mm -hmm. and later as a young woman mm -hmm. in Selma, Alabama. Can you explain to, to us what happened? And those two events, I think, kind of diverged, didn't they, in a way? In a way, yeah. I mean, I was, I'm, I'm a survivor of child sexual abuse. It started at seven years old. And in my experience, we, and, and I think people actually don't acknowledge this enough, that in October 2017, when Me Too went viral, it wasn't just people talking about being harassed at work or, you know, having a, a Weinstein kind of experience. It was a lot of people who had experienced sexual assault on college campuses or child sexual abuse. And, um, and the thing about sexual violence is that regardless of the circumstances that got you there, the thing that it leaves you with is what connects us. It's that common trauma that we have that we're trying to overcome. Um, and so that's what sort of set me on. I was always into work around social justice, right? That's yeah. my whole life. And I was actually molded by people who were veterans of the civil rights movement, black power movement, like labor movements, things of that nature from the 60s and 70s. And while I was living in Selma, Alabama, which is everybody knows for its historic story. Because you grew up in New York. I, I grew up in New York. I'm from the Bronx. And then you... <laughs> and, then, and then you went to college in Alabama, yeah. and then you started doing work in Selma. Yes, and I I'd actually started in high school because I was in a program that was based in Selma. And we had these larger-than-life figures who would come and talk to us. And one of them was um, Reverend James Bevel, who a lot of people don't know his, his name, but you know his work. If you know the Children's March during the, um, or the Selma to Montgomery March, all of those things, he was like the chief lieutenant and architect of a lot of the biggest moments of the civil rights movement and one of Dr. King's right hand, you know, uh, confidants. He also was a serial pedophile and child molester. Um, and he showed up in Selma, you know, with his sort of band of misfits. And I, through a series of different events, which I account in my book, uh, found out that he was a pedophile. And now, it, was, it was two things that kind of was jarring. The fact that he was this 
person and the fact that the community was willing to kind of overlook it. Right. Did you feel betrayed by the civil rights movement because oh. of that in a way? Not by the movement, because I don't define the movement by any singular person. And, and the, the movement, we're still in the movement, right? And so I don't think that any one person defines it. And so I don't, you know, I don't take away from, I don't even take away from his actual accomplishments, but I can separate his accomplishments from who he was. And so we, don't, we can benefit from his accomplishments without putting him on a pedestal. Right? You still have to be accountable for the things that you did. And what happens is that people were so enamored by who he was and who he stood next to that they were willing to overlook the harm that he was causing current day. And I think that's what happens in a lot of cases. Right? They weigh the, the benefits and, the, and, and, and who the people are and they say, well, we need this more than we need to protect children or we need to protect women or protect whoever. Um, and I just wouldn't do it because those same people who introduced me to him also said that I have a duty to my community. That's what they told me. That's what they had been training me for. And I looked around in this community and I saw all of these children and young people and other people who were experiencing sexual violence and there was no response to it. And what those same people told me is that community problems deserve a community response. And Me Too was a part of that response. You started holding these workshops. Mm -hmm. For, for young girls of color. Yes. And you would talk about victims of sexual violence mm -hmm. and you would give details about their experiences. Mm -hmm. And then you would reveal these were very famous women. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, I was working it with young girls and pop culture has a hold on our children as we know. And I was trying to figure out a way to, have, to make this conversation digestible for them, for them to understand. And so, I, you know, when Gabrielle Union, for instance, was, was a, a person who spoke openly about having been sexual assaulted. When I just, or Oprah Winfrey, you know, or Fantasia, or Maya, uh, Maya Angelou, you know, that there were all these stories that I knew the kids didn't know. They only saw the after effects. And what I wanted them to know was there's life after, right? You are not the sum total of what happened to you. And so I would tell them the story of these women without giving their names. And then when I gave the name, they'd go, oh, no, that's impossible. Because they thought, how could something that happened to me happen to some, somebody like Oprah? And how could they go on to and be become, successful right. adults? And, and so that's what I wanted to really capture for them, that there is triumph after the trauma. And it worked. And, and how did it impact your own personal story? Because you kept that so secret. Uh, see, and, and, and for so long, and, and did their empowerment or empowering them help you find the, the strength in yourself to talk about what happened to you at seven? It, it kind of forced me to. See, I thought I was going to protect myself. I thought, I'm going to help. It's too late for me. You know, I'm going to help the children. Um, but it, I realized very quickly that I could not authentically help them without authentically facing the things that I had dealt with. And you know, there's a, there's a way that we can operate in the world where we, you can speak one thing, but you don't actually live it. So I was very good at speaking it, you know, and I could speak healing into the children and talk about it, but I couldn't face it in myself. And when those two things came together, I realized, oh, I can't, I'm not actually doing this work well unless I'm working on myself. And so it, that work forced me to deal with my own, my own sort of stuff. I know that you felt shame, but it took you quite a while to feel anger. Yeah. And, and you ran into uh, your abuser unexpectedly mm -hmm. at, at a Father's Day event in your old neighborhood in the Bronx. He, he was a police officer now mm -hmm. and had kids. And how did that feel seeing him for the first time in, I guess, many years, right, it, At that point, it was probably about 30 plus years. Um, it was the first time I had tapped into that anger. See, I grew up feeling like not he did a bad thing, but we did a bad thing. I felt complicit in my own abuse because what I was told is that good girls don't let people touch their private parts. And good girls don't go into dark corners with grown, with grown boys. You know, like I had heard all of these rules, but because nobody- Because he was 18, right? He was probably about 18 and I was seven. And so I, I thought, I'd heard the rules, but what no adult had ever said to me is, if one of these rules is broken, it's not your fault. So I spent years feeling complicit, like, I broke the rules, I'm a bad girl. 
And I, by the time I saw him, I had been doing work, I had been doing this work for a while, and finally the anger came. And, I, and interestingly enough, the anger came because he didn't recognize me, right? I'm standing there, and this is a person who has occupied so much of my brain for 30 plus years, and he looked right through me as if he didn't, didn't recognize me at all, and I thought, how do you get to have a life? How dare you get to have a life and I have to live with this thing that you left me? You know, and, and that, I'm from the Bronx, so those F-bombs come fast. <laughs> <laughs> so did you say something to me? I didn't, I, I, I mean, it, it came up in my spirit. And funny thing, my mother was there and I was like frozen in place because it's like several, several questions right now, like, what do I do? I just didn't know what to do. I saw my mother, I said, I wanna go. And my mother saw it and she realized it was happening. She put it together quickly. And then my mother also, mama bear, I knew she wanted to do something too. But what do you say? You did this to my child 35 years ago. You know, like it was just, it was overwhelming and we left. But it was also the moment in the, the car ride home, we just got in a taxi, we left everybody. We left our family, everybody. And we got in a taxi and I was crying. I was like, why didn't he even recognize me, you know? And, and, and my mother said because, something to the effect of, because he tried to break you and he can't recognize you because you turned out to be a smart, beautiful, accomplished, <laughs> capable, you know? And, and it was really a, a turning point for me because I thought, no, he didn't win. I won, right? You did. <laughs> You know, uh, I wanted to ask you about the hashtag Me Too, mm -hmm. uh, which really took off in 2017, and some, in some ways it was co-opted by famous white women. Well. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was your reaction? They were when very that nice happened? white ladies. Um, <laughs> well, and I, and I usually, I, I like to clarify this because the truth of the matter is, I'm being funny, but the truth of the matter is the women who came forward in, in both of those articles talking about Harvey Weinstein didn't know who I was at all and also did not know what the risk was they were going to take. They didn't know what the outcome was going to be. They didn't do it to start a movement. <laughs> they thought they were going to be blackballed, a lot of them. They thought they may not work again. And so there's a, there's a kind of a fine line. I think because so many black women have experienced that, that they're being erased and being removed from their work, there's a, a hedge of protection around this that a lot of people are like, you won't take this from her. But I think two things happen simultaneously. It wasn't the women, and I wanna be really clear about this because what the world will do is find new reasons to pit women against each other, right? Yeah. <laughs> it, it wasn't the women who came out and co-opted the movement and said, well, we have the mutual movement now. It was the media who, who looked around and said, well, I got, I don't know, A-list celebrity over here and I got 44-year-old black lady from the Bronx over here. <laughs> nah, you know? It was the media who constantly kept bringing the story back to them. And this is the evidence that you know that it wasn't them co-opting it because the media doesn't even talk about them anymore, right? Yeah. Now we, we shifted from talking about the famous white women to talking about the famous white men, the, or the men, period, who's, who, you know, what's gonna happen in their lives? How are they gonna recover? You know, will they, can they come back? It's and their so redemption. It's, it's about their redemption. It's not even, most people could not, you, if I said to this audience right now, can you name me 10 people who were affected by Me Too? And they'd be Weinstein, Lauer, Charlie Rose, da da da, they'd run off the list. If I say name me 10 of their survivors, you can't do it, right? And that's, that's the part why I'm careful about the, the idea of co-opting. Those women came forward to bravely tell their story, unaware of what would happen. The media loves white women. They love y'all. You know, I, I, <laughs> you know? I, yeah. so, I, I that, write about that in my book. Right, you, you know, do. like missing right. white win, women's syndrome. Exactly. And the truth of the matter is we all feed into it. We want to know these same celebrities are the ones we want to know what they're wearing, who they're marrying, you know, who they're dating, who they're divorcing. We want to know about their lives. We eat up the, and consume everything about their lives. So now this huge story comes out, this salacious story, and the media focused on the salaciousness of it. 
but really, the, the Me Too movement is because 12 million people responded to a hashtag in 24 hours. It's not because of, you know, whoever A-list celebrity. Those people were a part of it, and honestly, it wouldn't have stayed a story if they weren't a part of it. So I, 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 I get why people say there was co-option, and I just, want the, I just don't want this to be about women fighting women. Right? Yeah. Because it's, it's more so about us fighting a system that continues to perpetuate the same stories and stereotypes and ideas and, you know, that's what it's about and I fight that every day. Well, let's talk about those systems. I mean, it's been four years mm -hmm. since, you know, this, this huge wave of support for Me Too, yeah. many more years since you started using mm -hmm. the expression, but have those systems been, um, broken down, have they, ch oh, I can tell that's a no. <laughs> uh, um, no, ask the question. <laughs> yeah, ha no, ha has, have there been changes? And what positive changes have you seen? Because things, haven't things changed a little bit? A little bit, sure. <laughs> no, sure, I mean, I'm not even, sure. I think that, look, I used to be the person who was begging people to put me on their agenda, like, hey, can I get five minutes at the end of this? Can I just talk to the people, right? So it's n never in my wildest dreams that I think we could have a sustained national or international dialogue about sexual violence. And that's amazing. We've been talking about this for four years. People talk about things like, you know, I think about Cuomo stepping down, right? What has happened is that people look at uh, are watching the Me Too movement like a spectator sport. So it's like, oh, uh, the governor of New York stepped down. That's a one for the Me Too movement. Oh, Bill Cosby got out of jail. Well, that's one, one away from the Me Too. It's not, that's not how it is, right? We're not taking score. What has changed is five years ago, a woman could not have come forward and had the kind of investigation that Tish James did that led to Cuomo stepping down. We can never control the outcome. We can't control the people that cause harm or the perpetrators. Cuomo could have just said, I'm not stepping down, you know? Uh, Weinstein could have been found not guilty. We can't control that. What I'm most invested in is the fact that we are having trials, that we're having investigations, that people can come forward and say, listen, I have been harmed by this person, and we take it seriously. It's not about believing all women. It's not about believing all accusations. It's about listening to them. We are coming out of, we, we, we have such short memory, right? You've done this a long time. Four or five years ago, 10 years ago, these things just went away. Yeah. And Ten in some years. cases, they still are. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But also, there was a time period where these things would come up, and the first line of defense were the questions, right? Well, what were you wearing? Why were you there? Well, he's a good guy. Are you sure? Maybe it's a misunderstanding. When we say believe survivors, it is because that is what we were up against a decade ago, half a decade ago. Now what people say is, wow, we need to look into this, right? So, you know, policies have changed, laws have changed. We're coming up on five years next year. What I really want people to think about is what has Me Too made possible? not the scores that we're keeping. And not has it solved everything. It's not gonna solve anything. We've been, this is a decades and decades and decades old issue. There was, there's sexual violence in the Bible, right? Like this, this is just not gonna go away from a hashtag. It's just not that, it's not magic, right? Before, I, I wanna ask you before we finish up, and I just love talking to you, Tarana. You're just such a force. It's just amazing. <laughs> Big cheers up there. <laughs> um, you know, I have to ask you about Time's Up, which was a, a separate movement, but I think spurred by Me Too, yeah, yeah, to, sure. to fight for gender equality in, in the workforce. And that whole thing seemed to have imploded because, well, what happened, Tarana? So like the board, <laughs> the board uh, all left and the two founders were advising Governor Cuomo on how to react or yeah. to how to attack one of the accusers. I mean, not, you know, uh, you to, yeah. to bad mouth one of the accusers. What happened there? Well, first, people do this all the, they conflate me too and time's up all yeah, the time, I, right? That's, that's, so I just want, I want the people to know, it's not me. <laughs> <laughs> 
But also, the thing that's, that's unfortunate is kind of what I was saying about the co-option earlier. Time's Up is a, a young organization that was trying to attack an old problem. And they were trying to do it with new tools and new ideas. And I think what a lot of people, and there was a lot of powerful people involved, and I think that what people forget is that sexual violence is about power. It's about the co-option of power, I mean, the, the uh, corruption of power, right? And it's the, and the, 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 the unchecked accumulation of power. And people are enamored by that. Just like, I think, you know, if you think about Matt Lauer, right? We talk, I know you talk about him in your book. I'm quite sure there were people or women around him who whispered in his ear, who gave him advice, who thought it's more important to protect this person than it is to protect the people. And I think it's the same thing that happens, we see it over and over again. As long as we are invested in the patriarchy, we will default to the patriarchy. And it, it, it's just what happens, right? And I think in a case of, of Time's Up, people made mistakes. I don't think we should hold, indict the whole organization now. I think that organization did a lot of good work. It's continuing to do a lot of good work. They've done all of this soul searching and you know, they changed leadership, what have you. But it's the same old thing. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're a woman or a man. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican. Patriarchy is insidious. And it is, we were all raised and socialized in it. And so I think our default is to protect powerful men. And as long as that keeps happening and we keep defaulting to that, you cannot, you cannot change something like as, as, as big and broad and, and insidious as and sexual violence that. as, yeah, with, with the same tools. You just can't do it. So if you're trying to use power to take down power, it's just not, it's just not gonna work. We have to rethink the whole thing, tear the whole thing down. This is why I'm saying it's not partisan, right? A lot of the players that we saw moved out of the like, administrations, the government administrations, and moved into the private sector. And I wrote this thing on Twitter that was not popular with a lot of people, but I'm like, you can't be a Democrat first. You can't be a Republican first, right? If you want to fight this thing in a real way, you have to be a human being first, right? The reason why this keeps happening over and over and over again is because we prioritize the same thing in Weinstein. We prioritize power and money and, and you know, those kind of things over humanity. At the end of the day, this is people, the people who experience the violence or who are trying to prevent the violence, we want people to have the right to walk through life with their dignity and their humanity intact. I should be able to show up at my job, my church, my, my home, anywhere with my dignity intact, with my humanity intact. And when people are harassed, sexual harassment chips away at that. Sexual violence also chips away at that. And so we have to think about this very differently. We have to approach it very differently. The same things that we did before, putting a so-and-so in the White House is not gonna change it. Taking a so-and-so out of the White House is not gonna change it, right? This is about something bigger than politics. And I think people just keep getting caught in that. Oh, we just got to, we just got to know. We got to tear the whole thing down. Well, we've got, we've got this, uh, I, I mean, I love this audience. This has been my favorite audience. Don't tell the other cities. But, but, you know, I mean, we have so many smart, engaged people who really care about, you know, making things better here. So what can the average person do to kind of, help support this movement and keep I'm it. Tell you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm glad you asked. I'm gonna go back to what I said. This is a movement. What people don't, you throw a hashtag in front of a word and people call it a movement. I appreciate the hashtag because it amplified the movement, but movements are made by people, everyday people. Right? We would not have the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act. We would not have so many things that movement gave us if people didn't join those movements. So figure out a thing, whatever the thing you're most comfortable with. You can donate money, you can donate time. But the other part, we created something called Act Two because people are always like, well, what do I do? Learn about this as an issue. Sexual violence is a social justice issue. We are fighting for survivor justice. And so everyday people need to, the reason why we had something like the Weinstein verdict is because people finally are understanding the depth and breadth of what this does to your body, to your person, right? 
Educate yourselves. If you can't volunteer, if you can't pick up a sign and go out and protest, it's okay. We don't need everybody to do that. I need doctors, lawyers, dentists, accountants, receptionists, clerks. I need you to understand what sexual violence does, how much of it is around you. Talk to the people around you. Talk to your peers. It's not just women. It's not just men. It's people across the gender spectrum. Educate yourself about what this is and how it impacts your life and then find your place in it because there is definitely a place for everybody in this. Read a book, listen to a podcast, listen to an article, but be engaged. Don't just say, oh, I wonder who they're gonna meet to next. Stop making it a verb, that's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> that's annoying. It's not a verb. It is a declaration that people whose lives have been deeply impacted by something that is awful say to try to reclaim some of their humanity. And we just need you to, we can't do that alone. And so that's a call to action I put out to people. We are, those of us who are saying me too, need you to act too. Wow. <laughs> well, by the way, um, I just want to mention, Tarana's daughter is here. She must be so <laughs> proud of you, Tarana. And, I think this conversation resonated with a lot of people in this audience. Oh, One of my friends in particular, I think she has taken great comfort in some of the words you've spoken tonight. Oh, Tarana Burke, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank